Greetings and welcome to another installment of Quant Slob. This time around, we're going to take a look at Simpson's Paradox. This edition, I think, really represents the first purely topical episode here on Quant Slob. If you're interested, I suggest you check out our foundational series. We just wrapped it up. I playlisted the entire series for your enjoyment and convenience. Simpson's Paradox is named after A1 Edward Hughes Simpson, uh, who is otherwise known as having served as a British codebreaker or crypt analyst during World War II. Not to be confused with Thomas Simpson, uh, who was around about uh, two centuries prior and who is known for his super cool Simpson's rule or Simpson's approximation. Sometimes when I, I look at a picture of a historical figure, I try to imagine what it would be like to hang out with the person. I ask myself, um, if the party keg was running low, would this person offer to make a keg run? And uh, based on a picture, I know that this is highly unscientific, but it's sort of amusing, and sometimes amusement is more important than science. And I'll tell you for sure, this uh, Edward Simpson character is definitely throwing off a vibe here in this picture, and I'm not sure if uh, this guy would volunteer to hop in his dually and make a keg run. Maybe he would. I don't know that for sure. But I definitely got him pegged as offering to chip in. And of course, as we all know, that's the next best thing. Moving on. Uh, most introductory examples we'll see illustrating Simpson's paradox involve a three-factor setup. What we're going to do here in this edition is demonstrate how to fashion an example of a three-factor paradox. In other words, we're going to simulate results to illustrate Simpson's paradox. Then we're going to discuss how such an unusual thing can possibly be. We start by imagining a population of 210 coin tosses. And there's a lot of ways to do this, okay? This is just an example. We ascribe three categorical attributes or factors, each of these with two categories. You can see which hand was used to toss the coin, left, right, which of two coins were used, coin A or coin B, and lastly, the outcome of the flip, heads, tails. We're going to create a two by two table to show the distribution of the proportion of heads given the other two factors, which hand was used and which coin was flipped. The number of flips in our population is 210. To start our simulation, this particular example, we're going to select a number that's a little less than half of 210. So we'll choose 100. It's a nice easy number to work with. And we're going to enter this number on a diagonal here. And what we're saying here is that coin A was flipped with the left hand 100 times and coin B was flipped with the right hand 100 times. For the upper left, we're going to say that half the flips came up heads, say 50, 50 heads. And we'll have the lower right be a ratio that's a little less than one half. We'll say 48, but it could, 45 would work here too. We have 10 flips whose outcomes have not been described in the table here. Uh, we'll split this in half and enter fives here on the other diagonal. Uh, for coin A, now, what we're looking for here is a numerator that makes the right-hand proportion of heads a little greater than that of the left hand. For coin B, we want a numerator that makes the left-hand proportion of heads a little less than that of the right hand. So here we go. Three-fifths and two-fifths does the trick, respectively. Uh, it completes the paradox. And so we arrive at a situation where we can see here that left-handed flips yielded a higher ratio of heads than right-handed flips. Uh, 52 over 105 is greater than 51 over 105. However, for both coin A and coin B, the opposite is true. For both coin A and coin B, right-hand flips, not left-hand flips, produced a higher ratio of heads. Three-fifths is greater than 50 over 100, and 48 one-hundredths is greater than two-fifths. And I want to point out an interesting property of this particular simulation. Notice that the two marginal distributions are uniform. Okay, what do I mean? The number of left-hand flips is the same as right-hand flips, 105. We can see that here. Uh, the number of flips of coin A is the same as coin B. It's not shown, but uh, they're both 105 if you just sum up the numbers in the columns. So what do we make of all this? Um, the result we simulated here appears almost contradictory. Of course, it cannot be a contradiction because within the hallowed halls of math and formal logic, there is no such thing as a true contradiction. Formal logic, I'm not talking about dialectic logic or a so-called logic of inconsistency or any of their ilk. Okay, so it's not a contradiction, but the result certainly seems paradoxical. When discussing this topic, many sources draw attention to what could be viewed as a modeling problem. That is the omission of variables or covariates, usually with some moderating effect on the three factors we're examining. 
this is always an important consideration. But what I want to offer is a much more rudimentary and frankly mundane explanation from a purely arithmetic perspective. And once we see it, it kind of spoils the mystery. Simply said, the value of a ratio is nonlinear with respect to the denominator. The ratio three-fifths we use describes one more head's outcome than two-fifths, three, two. The ratio 51 hundredths describes two more heads outcomes than 48 one hundredths, 50, 48. However, the difference between three-fifths and two-fifths is 10 times greater than the difference between 51 hundredths and 48 one hundredths. And there we have it. Uh, if it should please you, it would please me greatly. There's a little subscribe button down there. I'd appreciate it. That's going to do it this time around. Thank you very much for tuning in, and don't forget to stay tuned for more Quant Slob.